Okay, and welcome back. Today we're going to continue our conversation about Constantine the Great. Okay, Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great is truly one of these transformative figures. Uh, in history, there's various different kinds of methodologies and school of, uh, schools of thought. Uh, there is uh, there used to be this what we call the great man hypothesis that history didn't move unless there was some great man to move it and that's more or less been passed over by the new history which argues that things are more the product of movements and social forces than any one great individual but if there's a person you could make the case for the great man of history it would have to be Constantine the Great uh, Constantine the Great shows up Christianity becomes the state religion and Christianity gets massive new churches, huge patronage, and it fundamentally changes Christianity forever. It's really hard to see how that would have happened without Constantine the Great. So who was he? Well, he's actually the son of the Tetrarch Constantius Chlorus. So if you remember at the end of the Tetrarchy, the Roman Empire had been broken into two halves. Each of those halves was broken into a north and a south uh, part. You had two uh, senior emperors called Augusti and two junior emperors called Caesars. And one of those junior emperors was a guy named Constantius Chlorus. Well, he be then became the Augusti when the Augusti retired, thus guaranteeing this, uh, you know, uh, succession in an orderly fashion. Uh, and his son was Constantine. Now, Constantius Chlorus was not supposed to hand it over to his son, and in fact, he didn't hand it over to his son. But when he died, uh, his men, his armies, declared his son to be the next Caesar, that is, the next junior emperor anyway. And this sparked off a massive civil war that eventually ended with Constantine killing all of the remaining tetrarchs and claiming sole authority as the only emperor left. He defeats uh, Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312, and then he actually goes on later to defeat Licinius in, uh, in the east, and he becomes the sole emperor. But he does a number of important things. Uh, first off, it's important to note that he was familiar with Christianity. So if you remember back at the beginning of the other lecture, where I sat and talked over the chronology a lot, I had to be dull, I apologize for that. But we talked about the Diocletian purges. So in 305, Diocletian sends out an order. He sends an order to all his generals and to all the other junior emperors, including Constantius Chlorus, and he tells them, purge the Christians from the leadership, uh, purge them from the ranks of civil administrators and generals in the Roman army. And he sends this letter to Constantius Chlorus, and Constantius Chlorus writes a letter back and says, oh, yep, yeah, we're killing Christians, slaughtering so many Christians. Oh, my gosh, you wouldn't believe how many Christians we're killing. Uh, but as near as we can tell, that never happened. Constantius Chlorus actually wrote that he was killing Christians, but it doesn't appear that he actually did anything at all. There was no persecution where he was at. He was in the western and northern half of the empire, and it doesn't look like there was any per ser serious persecutions at that time in that region of the world. And so the question is why? Well, we kind of know the reason why. The reason why is uh, Constantius Chlorus was married to a Christian, uh, uh, Queen Helena. Now, while there's lots of doubt about whether Constantine was a Christian or not himself, we'll talk more about that in a bit, everybody believes Helena was a devout Christian. So it makes sense Constantius Chlorus wouldn't kill all the Christians in the army, because that would make things a little awkward with the wife. So, honey, what did you do today? Oh, I killed everyone in your religion. It's not going to happen. So it seems that he just lied to Diocletian about uh, purging them. So Constantine the Great's an interesting character because his dad's a pagan, his mom's a Christian, and he has a foot in both worlds. He obviously knows a lot about Christians. He obviously knows a lot about pagans. And his father didn't want him to be a Christian, probably because it would have limited his chances in, in uh, careers in, in Roman political life. At any rate, Constantius dies, uh, and Constantine the Great is declared by Constantius Chlorus's armies and men to be the next Caesar, and this starts off a whole new civil war. This civil war uh, eventually has him going to Rome, where he fights the Battle of the Milvian Bridge against Maxentius, and that's a very important event. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
But then it also, after he defeats Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, he issues the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan makes Christianity a state religion. And I want to make this clear, it makes it a state religion, not the state religion. Paganism is still around and will be for at least another century. Uh, and both paganism and Christianity will be official state religions. Uh, the other thing that he does short order than that is he calls together the Council of Nicaea. So the Edict of Milan basically ends the persecution against Christians, and Constantine becomes the personal patron of the Christian faith. He builds a series of magnificent churches. Uh, he builds a series of, of new churches in Rome. In fact, he builds the first things that we can call formal churches that aren't just converted house churches. He also sponsors his mother on a trip to the Holy Land so that she can go and recover the holy sites and the locations of the birth of Jesus and the Holy Sepulcher where Jesus, uh, Jesus' body was laid. And so he funds all of this, and he finds himself now dealing with the Christians. But the Christians were every bit as fractious as the pagans were, and persecuted each other almost as much as the Romans persecuted them. So he's got a huge empire and lots of division. So he calls the Council of Nicaea in 325. This is in Nicaea in Asia Minor. And he calls them to iron out all of the details. Now, this is where you get into some pretty bad conspiracy theory stuff. This is where Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code come in, and they claim that Constantine was not a true believer, that he forced all of this pagan stuff on Christianity. The truth is, we actually have a lot of early church histories from the time, and many of the church historians were very suspicious of Constantine. Uh, they recognized he wasn't a Christian, or at least not a fully Christian. He did not become a Christian until his deathbed. He was not baptized until his deathbed. And he actually wanted to resolve some of the issues at the Council of Nicaea by having everybody sing Kumbaya and get along, but the Christians were not about to sing Kumbaya. That's because they had these massive theological differences, the big one being the Arians. The Arians denied the divinity of Christ, and that was just a step too far for most Christians, and so they had to get rid of Arius and the Arians and his followers, and that was what came out of the Council of Nicaea. And so he actually didn't get his way at the Council of Nicaea, so it's hard to imagine him as this, uh, you know, nefarious person. I think the best way to look at Constantine is to see him as a man of his times. Um, I think that he was a person who, because of his mother, had genuine experience with Christianity and probably was pretty sympathetic to Christianity. He supported the Christians a lot. He made sure that they got churches, made sure that they were protected. But at the same time, he's also the ruler of a mostly pagan empire. Christians were at most maybe 30-40% of the population, and lots of the Roman Senate, lots of the Roman aristocracy were still pagan. And so he has to have a foot in both camps. He has to appease the pagans and the Christians. Uh, and so he does a bunch of interesting things. He allows pagans to build a temple to his genius, because that was a typical thing. That's something no Christian probably would have allowed, but he had to do that. Uh, and the church historian, I think it's Scholasticus, also says that he shows up at the Council of Nicaea dressed as the god Sol Invictus. So you're, you're showing up at the Council of Nicaea dressed as another god. It's kind of funny. Uh, but he really didn't have a choice in that, because by that point, Sol Invictus was so closely associated with the role of the emperor that that was just what the dress was. I secretly suspect that his 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 faith and his inner life was probably sympathetic to Christians, but he was a very cagey and a very ruthless guy, and he's got an empire to run, and so he doesn't want to piss anybody off. So he enters in this kind of exceptional person, person to hammer out these details. And the other thing, of course, is that he moves the capital to Constantinople. He moves it to this city called Byzantium and renames it after himself. He had 10 children. He named them all after himself. So he's one up to George Foreman in that regard. And he is this phenomenal character. He is the person who's going to shift the focus of the empire towards Christianity, shift the focus of the empire towards the east. And this may be the end of what we call antiquity and the beginning of the early Middle Ages, anywhere you could put those dates. So let's talk a little bit about Constantine the Great and how this conversion to Christianity happens. First, let's talk about the official story. So this is a tapestry 
um, that was designed by Raphael, the great Renaissance uh, painter. So this isn't from the time period. But this shows a very famous event that takes place early in the life of Constantine. So Constantine is going to fight Maxentius. The battle is in array. All the forces are gathered on either side um, of the valley. And they're meeting near the uh, Milvian Bridge. You can actually see the Milvian Bridge. Let me get my cursor over here. You can actually see the Milvian Bridge right there in the background. Let me grab the pen. And you can actually see it right there in the background. So the night before the battle, Constantine is going to face off against another one of these tetrarchs and, and in this civil war for who's going to control Rome. And he decides to go on a walk and he decides to go gaze up into the sky. This is a fairly typical thing for any Roman to do. You would look up into the sky. You would try to read the signs in the heavens, the clouds, the um, and the flights of birds to look for signs and portents about who is going to win the battle. And as he looks up into the sky, he sees... Uh, a sign. Now here, Raphael has depicted it as a cross, but it's not a cross, at least it's not in most traditions. In most traditions, it's actually a thing we call the Cairo monogram, and it looks like this. It is made up of a chi, which looks like an X, but this is the Greek letter chi, and then it is combined with rho. Rho is this letter, which looks like a P, but actually stands for the sound uh, that R makes in the Greek alphabet. So this is chi rho. And these are the first two letters in the, the name of, and I'll just write it out for you if I can. This is in the Greek. Chris. Ah, I ran out of space. Okay, so there's an S down here somewhere as well. Christos which is the name of Christ. So those first two letters combine together to make up the Cairo monogram. And with this, he sees uh, words in the heavens. And the words say, in the Latin, in hoc signo vincit, in the, Latin, in the Greek, in toinera vica, uh, nike. Uh, but either one, that means, under this sign you shall conquer. So he tells all of his men to go and put this sign on their shields. And they do. And they go to battle the next morning, and they absolutely rout the forces of Maxentius. They push Maxentius' forces back to the Milvian Bridge. Maxentius is stuck on the bridge, and in the middle of the battle, he gets knocked off the bridge, and in his heavy armor, he sinks to the bottom of the river, and he drowns. And that's it. And Constantine becomes sole emperor in the west, and in a few years, he'll go and conquer Licinius in the east, and he'll become sole empire, emperor over the whole empire. He comes back to Rome then, and he establishes this monument. This is, again... Uh, a triumphal arch. So we've seen triumphal arch. We saw Severus's triumphal arch in the Roman Forum. We saw Titus's triumphal arch. This triumphal arch is just outside the Roman Forum. It's right in between the Forum and uh, the Colosseum. And it's an amazing monument on many levels. One, it's just a, a beautiful monument. But nearly everything that you see here is actually taken from a previous monument. In fact... Only these highlighted regions here were actually made during Constantine's time. Nearly everything else was stolen from another monument. Those large barbarians and panels on top, yeah, those were stolen from a monument to Trajan and to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, these roundels that you see here, these were actually taken from a monument to Hadrian. Now this is a tradition we call spoilia, and it's actually intentional. Spoilia is where you take pieces of past Roman emperors' monuments and you build them into your monuments. Now, that just seems like cheating <laughs> to us, but it's not. <coughs> yes, I did cough into my elbow, just so you know. Uh, it's not cheating. It's actually a kind of homage. You want to be associated with these great emperors of the past, so you take pieces of their great monuments and incorporate it into your monument to show how great you are. Okay. But it also shows a sharp break in style. If you look at the style, you'll notice that uh, the style of Hadrian's monuments, uh, those beautiful roundels, are very classical. We have beautiful drapery. But if we look below that, we see this very different relief. This is a relief, and this is a liberalata scene. This is a, a scene where the emperor gives out gifts to his men. 
And you can see in the details right there that it looks very, very flat. It has that running drill, the use of the running drill. Um, the characters look flat and cartoon-like. They're not very well carved. Their, heart, their heads are large in proportion to their bodies. So if you remember towards the end of the reign of Diocletian, we saw that styles were getting more and more abstract. They were moving towards more narrative forms. And so we see both styles at use here. Now, some are from much earlier monuments, uh, but we know from other monuments they could carve in the classical style. They just chose not to. There is this preference for a more narrative style. Uh, and so when we look at this kind of artwork, this looks medieval to us. And according to Edward Gibbon, the reason that medieval art is so awful he hated it because the Christians lost the classical tradition. And this proves that's not true. This proves that rather than losing the classical tradition, um, when the Romans became Christians, they were continuing a trend towards greater abstraction, greater narrative, uh, you know, greater, uh, you know, symbolic content and moving away from classicism. And they'd been moving away from it for quite some time. Uh, and this is just when the Christians come to power. So we, asso we associate this change with Christians, but it was long predating the Christians. One other thing that's strange about this monument that I should pull out is that when you look at this inscription in the attic zone up here in the text, it has very interesting wording. For example, uh, up here in this section here, and I'll just make sure I get the right pen color. Up here in this section, instead of it saying that he was helped by Christ, it says that he was given aid in the battle by divine assistance, and it doesn't mention the deity. So that shows the very fine line that Constantine is walking. He is trying to be an emperor to both pagans and Christians simultaneously, and uh, it shows how this thing is, is really kind of fudged through. Constantine makes a number of changes um, everywhere he goes. One of the biggest changes he makes is to a monument that was already being built by Maxentius. Uh, we call this the Basilica of Maxentius because he built it. Constantine took it and renamed it, but we also sometimes call it the Basilica Nova. It's a massive monument being built in the Roman Forum, and it doesn't look like any basilica we've seen so far. Basilicas have columns. They have interior courtyards. This has enormous vaults, and in fact, it doesn't look like a basilica. It looks like the frigidarium of a bathhouse. So you remember we talked about Caracalla's bathhouse, and I said, believe it or not, the bathhouses are the biggest things the Romans ever built. They were their most impressive monuments. They were the most technically advanced. And those things are going to be the great inspiration for the great cathedrals of Europe. And the Romans were already taking this kind of architecture, which was invented for bathhouses, and using it to make really monumental basilicas. Now, this basilica, when it was first created, like all basilicas, was meant to be entered from the long side. So here you can see those massive windows that let in light, and it has an entrance on the side. And so you were supposed to enter it from this way. But when Constantine took it over, he changed it, and he added a porch on the other end and changed the orientation that direction. That's very interesting. So the orientation used to be like this, and now the entrance comes that way. And all of this directs your attention to a colossal statue of Constantine. And when we say colossal, we mean genuinely colossal. I mean, look at the size of this thing. I mean, that hand alone is nearly six feet high. Uh, this thing down here uh, that we see right here, this is, this is a knee <laughs> right here. Uh, look at this portrait. It's just amazing. Uh, look at this hand. So we only have parts of this left, but this thing must have just been a magnificent, uh, nearly 40-foot statue, 40-foot sitting down statue of Constantine. And so instead of entering from the side and the long side, you entered from the short side and you made this long procession up to Constantine. Frankly, it feels very much like a pagan temple. It feels very much like a pagan temple dedicated to Constantine. Um, but it, it is basically a monument to himself. And when we see the portraits of Constantine, he continues this idea that we saw under the soldier emperors. So, for example, under the soldier emperors, we see 
uh, more expressive eyes, more expressive, more psychological portraiture. And he just continues that, except it gets even more abstract. The eyes are inhumanly eye large. Oh my gosh, they're like anime eyes. It's crazy. Uh, now I feel like I want to animate sparklies in them. Oh my gosh. And now I want to do a chibi Constantine. Ugh. Okay. These are, these lectures are revealing entirely too much about my personality. Moving on. So it shows this movement towards abstraction. Now, why he did this, why he rechanged this hallway to turn it into a gigantic monument to himself in Rome, we actually have a little sense of why that may have happened. That's because he already had a similar hall in Trier, Germany. Trier was where his capital was before he came down and beat Maxentius in, uh, in Rome and took charge of Rome. And there was a massive Ola Palantina, which is just a fancy Latin term for audience hall. This is where you would meet him. He was the, the Caesar of this part of the Roman Empire. And when we look at it, it's a longitudinal hall. It used to have a, a kind of portico on either side. And then it had a massive apse on one end. And we can see that apse right here. This is where the apse is. So this longitudinal hall and an apse. Well, when you look at it today, it feels very much like a church. In fact, it's been converted to a church and it is a church today. He's going to sneeze, and I jinxed it. <sighs> that is the magic spell for how never to see sneeze. You say, I am going to sneeze, and the sneeze will go away. It's the same thing for banishing items. You take an item. If you want to banish it, you say, I will place this in a place. I will never forget it. Then you place it in that place, and it will disappear forever, and no one will remember where it went. So that's your magic lesson for the day. Okay. So when we look at this building, it looks like a church, and that's not accidental. It is, in fact, an audience hall. His throne would have been way down at the apse. This is something that's designed to uh, be imposing, to intimidate a person. He has to walk all the way up to it. Uh, and this is secular architecture. This, for Romans, didn't have a religious association. It was secular architecture. It was an audience hall for a king or a ruler. Now, why is that significant? because the most important building built for early Christianity is going to be Old St. Peter's. And when they build it, they do not build it in the style of a Roman temple or anything like that. They're going to build it in the style of an audience hall. So let's go back and talk about that. So according to Christian tradition, um, Peter is uh, martyred sometime in the year uh, 66, 67, maybe as late as 68, we don't know for sure. Uh, and he is crucified upside down. And he was crucified in the circus of Nero. Nero was this terrible ruler uh, who persecuted Christians and Jews. And they were going to crucify him right side up, but as they were about to crucify him, he said, no, no, I don't deserve to be crucified in the same way as my Lord Jesus. And so they said, sure, fine, we'll, we'll accommodate you. And they flipped him upside down and crucified him upside down. Just shows how Romans had a really sick sense of humor. So the other thing is all of your heavy metal albums that told you that the upside down cross was satanic, they were lying to you. The upside down cross is actually the cross of St. Peter. Eh, Ugh, heavy metal was all a lie. Ah, it deserved to die in the 90s. Sad. Ah, I still miss Winger. Moving on. So here we are at the Circus of Nero. Well, after he was crucified, they buried him right outside of the circus. So somewhere out here at around about this location right there, there was a little necropolis, a little cemetery, and they buried him. So he was buried right next to the circus. And over the years, um, Christians would come there to revere um, his tomb. And there was a little shrine built somewhere in the second century. It was a very simple shrine, had a, a little marble table. It was maybe about counter height, had two little marble columns and a little pediment, a little niche. You can see it here. And we have lots of Christian graffiti on this. Christians for a couple of centuries were coming to this location uh, to, you know, basically say, hey, I was here and to uh, remember uh, St. Peter and his bones were interred somewhere uh, back behind this. Well, then comes Constantine. Constantine comes to power. And what he wants to do is he wants to organize the Christians and he wants the Christians 
to have big buildings. And the Christians want big buildings. They've arrived. They no longer have to be in little uh, house churches. They want uh, big, impressive buildings. The pagans had big, impressive buildings. Why wouldn't you? And so it was decided that, well, okay, we're going to build a building, but we're going to build it right over this tomb. So here you can see in plan, this is the plan of the old circus. So here we have the circus here. This is the circus. This is where his tomb was, just outside the circus. And so they tear the circus down, and they build this new monumental church over the top of it. This outline that you can see here is the outline of the modern church. This is New St. Peter's. This is the church that's standing there today. So his tomb was right there. Let me just get back to... His tomb was right there, and they built the entire church around this tomb. They built a little shrine and they built a little apse. And the necropolis was not just St. Peter's. There were lots of uh, tombs. Lots of Christians wanted their tombs right next to St. Peter's tomb. And so that necropolis is under the current church. Uh, and it's still there. I've actually been there. It's actually kind of cool. It's, it's bizarre. There's this little tiny... Uh, first and second century Roman street with all these tombs that's right under the Vatican today. And uh, you can go see it. Uh, you have to arrange, get special tickets and special permission, but you can go see it. It's kind of cool. Uh, and so the Church of St. Peter's was built right on top of it, and it had a massive courtyard, and then it had this basilica. So the basilica is a secular form of architecture. It never had any religious associations for the Romans, and that's very important. Again, why? Well, it comes down to this very simple idea. If you're a Christian, you don't want to make any of these unnecessary associations with pagans, so you can't use a pagan temple because that is too close to worshiping the pagans. So you have to come up with a form of architecture that didn't have that association. So they use the basilica. Now the basilica was used as a courthouse, as an audience hall for governors or rulers. So it does have this very important association, but not with anything religious. So you can get away with it. You can fudge it over. Now this church, Old St. Peter's, becomes the fundamental basis of most of the churches in the West after this time. It becomes the basis for what we call the Basilica, or sometimes what we call the Latin Cross Plan. It has uh, several parts, and you should know these. Uh, the first is that it has the nave, and the nave is the gathering place. This is where people would gather. I have to stress how much this changes Christianity. Remember Christianity in the last, you know, first part of this lecture, they only met in small little house churches, maybe 30 or 40 people at a time. That was it. It was very intimate. It was very small. Quite frankly, it feels very much like what we're doing now. <laughs> there were no large gatherings. It was just small extended families, things like that. But now you have a big church. You can have 5,000 people come together if you want. And so that's what they did. They would have large gatherings. But, you know, you can't have small little intimate communal meals anymore. That means now what you got to do is you've got to have processions. You've got to have masses. So a lot of Christian liturgy, a lot of Christian ritual is going to be influenced by that. So you have the nave where you have gatherings, where you would gather people, teach sermons, homilies, and also have masses. Then you would have the altar, and the altar was where the tomb of St. Peter was. And so this was a very sacred place. But there's kind of a transition space between the apse, where the tomb of St. Peter is, and the nave, and that's the transept. And the transept is a fascinating addition. There were no transepts to Roman basilicas. In fact, transepts are a kind of Christian invention, and it's purely an invention of necessity. So this church actually serves two purposes. One, it's a place where lots of people can gather to hear about Christianity and to celebrate the rituals of Christianity. But it also has another purpose. It's a pilgrimage church. Christians had been coming to the tomb of St. Peter for centuries by this point, and they believed that doing so would give them special blessings. So you have two purposes that are conflicting with each other. Uh, one, you have an area where you have a mass of people where they can gather in this area here, but then you have pilgrims who are, aren't really there for the gathering. They're there for the relics of St. Peter, which are up here under the altar. And so you need a traffic solution, and that's what 
the trans that's what the transept is it's purely an efficient um, solution to the problems of dealing with these two different kinds of traffic so pilgrims could enter into the transept come up go up to the altar perform their pilgrimage and then exit without interfering with any of the action going on here and so it was purely um, a, a practical piece of architecture but it happened to be one of the greatest moments of serendipity in early Christianity because quite by accident and unintentionally they created a church that had a cross like shape and you can see this it has a long part over that goes all the way down and then it has another part which crosses it in the opposite direction and so this is a latin cross and a latin cross is just a cross where the bottom part of the cross is actually longer so this part is longer than the upper part or either of the arms uh, a greek cross all the arms are equal but a latin cross the lower arm is longer and so this became a latin cross you gotta think this has got to it's got to hit these people pretty well it's like wait a minute we built a cross-shaped building and we worship a guy who was nailed to a cross so it kind of works and so this will really become a major important building many many churches in the west will be patterned off of this building it wasn't the only basilica that were built there were several other basilicas that were built uh saint paul's outside the walls saint john laterans uh, etc uh, but this one will have a special place in the hearts of many christians now it's not the only church constantine built remember constantine sent his mom to the holy land so she he sent his mom to the holy land to recover the holy relics uh, and the holy sites associated with jesus christ and with mary now back in the reign of emperor hadrian hadrian was really sick to death of christians and jews and he couldn't tell the difference between them so he decided to completely obliterate um, the location of christ's tomb and he covered it in a massive temple to adonis tammuz and adonis tammuz is the synchristic deity tammuz is a western semitic deity adonis is a greek deity but they're both deities of grain and rebirth so obviously he was trying to say well you know forget your rebirth god i'll i'll give you a new rebirth god and he built a massive temple over it to deliberately keep christians from finding the site so when helena goes there they tear down the temple and under this they find the rock of calvary which is located right here this is where that's at that's the rock of calvary and they also find a quarry i can see this in the next image they find a quarry down here this is the where the quarry was and in the quarry they find so here's the rock of calvary uh, and this is the quarry so this quarry they found a bunch of timbers leftover timbers presumably from crucifixion and they pulled out three of these timbers and laid them each one of them one by one in front of a lame man and when one of them was set in front of the lame man he spontaneously got up and walked and so by this miracle they said this must be the true shards of the cross so a couple of miraculous discoveries and so they build this very very strange church now remember the tomb of christ was cut into the living rock there was actually a cliff face that went through here and uh, i actually got locked in the church of the holy sepulcher for 16 hours once i went there on a holy thursday to go see the uh, ceremony of washing the feet in the latin patriarchate um, but the doors of the church of the holy sepulcher are actually controlled by strangely enough muslim families uh, christians had fought so much in the church of the holy sepulcher that uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, the Muslim Ottoman emperor at the time, said, that's it, I'm taking the keys away from you, and I'm giving them to people who won't discriminate against one Christian or another. So the doors lock from the outside, and they lock them at night. Uh, so I got locked in overnight. Now, I knew what I was getting into. I knew that that was the price I had to pay, but there was a bunch of tourists who didn't realize that, and they got stuck in there too. So I got to wander all around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It was very fun. And sure enough, uh, there was a door that I knew about that if you looked behind that door, you could see that there was a massive cliff face back here. And amazingly enough, what they decided to do uh, at the time of Constantine is they took the tomb of Christ and they cut it entirely free from the living rock so this thing right here this is the edicule this is the tomb of christ 
but it used to be part of a massive cliff face that went across this way and they just completely cut around it. But you know, if you go there today and you know what door to look behind, you can still see the original cliff uh, that they cut through. Now the building itself is really kind of strange. On one side, we have a traditional basilica. It doesn't have a transept because it doesn't need it because there's no holy site there. Uh, the Rock of uh, Calvary is located in the corner of an open courtyard, but the Edicule is under a round building. Now that's very interesting. And so when we go back here, you can see that it's put under a round building. Uh, and the Edicule is right there, and it's still there today. Um, this is the Edicule as it looks today. Uh, this has been rebuilt many times, but a recent archaeological expedition proved that Yes, indeed you do. The original bedrock structure that had been cut from the living uh, cliff face is still in there. And so this is um, that tomb. So why would you do this? Why would you put a domed structure over a rock cut tomb that you freed from the cliff face? Well, the reason you did it is this is a kind of memorial architecture. So if you think back to the tomb of Diocletian, or to the tomb of Augustus. Those were all circular structures. There's this long-standing Roman tradition of having round structures over tombs. And so this was a tomb, even though Jesus was only buried here for, you know, three days, uh, and he rose up again, that's how it's conceived. And so they built a round building over a tomb, but you also needed a basilica so people could gather. So you had a courtyard and then a basilica on the other side. So this is strange because it shows that there are two different types of architecture that are in existence in the early Christian world. They're circular structures, and these circular structures we usually call martyrium, uh, martyria, plural, martyrium, singular. So you have circular structures like this, and then you also have longitudinal or horizontal structures, which are called basilicas. As it turns out, just the weird way that history works, centrally planned structures like martyria become the basis of churches in the East, in places like Constantinople and the Byzantine East, but basilica-shaped structures become the standard church type in the West. So right from the beginning, you can see there's a separation between East and West that happens. Uh, and so the Church of Holy Sepulcher is fascinating because it shows both of these types. It shows that at the early Christian period, they were still thinking in terms of both of these kinds of architecture simultaneously. Okay, well that ultimately gets us probably into this period that we call Byzantine. So there is no hard fast date where Roman Empire ends and the Byzantine Empire begins. In fact, as I stated in the last lecture, the Byzantines really do think of themselves as Romans. They called themselves Romanoi which is Greek for Romans. You would think it would be Latin, Romani, but it's not because they changed over to Greek. But you see that as the empire moves to the east, you see increase movement and diversification. And probably the best place to, to have this cutoff between east and west is probably the reign of Justinian. Justinian was the son of a swineherd who came to be captain of the guard and later assassinated the previous emperor and then made his himself emperor and then made his son emperor after him. Not bad. <laughs> but Justinian is known as, as one of the greats. He's known as Justinian the Great. And he establishes a new law code. He abolishes the Senate and the consuls. So these long-standing Roman institutions that had existed since before the days of the empire, um, since the days of the Republic. I'm suddenly getting Star Wars flashbacks. Let's go on. Uh, and in this law code, he, he says the will of the emperor is law. He also reconquers a big chunk of Italy and North Africa. Remember, the West is having its own problems. The West uh, collapsed in 476. And we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. And he reconquers those areas largely under the pretense that he's getting rid of those Arians, those Christians who denied the divinity of Christ. He also issues a whole series of land reforms, and this really gets us into this concept of what medieval life was like and how it was fundamentally different than Roman life. In Roman life, you were a citizen. You were free to travel anywhere you wanted in the empire, but at the same time, uh, you were also free to fail. Um, and what we see is there's a shift that happens. In the Roman law system, there were two categories. There were chiways, and chiways were citizens. 
and then there were colony, and colony were colonized peoples. And if you were a colonized people, well, you couldn't travel, uh, you couldn't have any trade you wanted, you pretty much were tied to the land, and you couldn't move without the permission of your dukes, your governor. Uh, and But, in theory, the governor was supposed to take care of you. The governor was supposed to guarantee that you were protected from war, that you had a, a kind of an allowance of food, etc., etc. Well, that sounds very much like a serf in the medieval system, and that's exactly what it was. And as Roman institutions began to collapse, more and more people said, you know, hey, being a Roman citizen is no great deal. Um, yeah, I've got citizenship, but, you know, I'm starving. Who cares? And so they preferred to be coloni, that is, to be treated like serfs. And many of the ancient Roman titles, like dukes, dukes means governor, D-U-X, it means governor. But dukes becomes duke. I forestalled the sneeze. The banishment of the sneeze spell did not work. Darn it. Uh, so dukes, or a duke, D-U-K-E, is basically a corruption of these ancient Roman practices. So what's funny is the people who were governors and elected officials under the Roman system quickly become hereditary um, nobles and aristocrats under the new medieval system. That happens in the West too, but you see it here in the early Byzantine world as, as well. So everything there in pink is the Byzantine Empire just before Justinian kind of reconquered it. As you can see, the West has completely fallen to a bunch of barbarians. I haven't talked about the barbarians. We'll talk about them next lecture, uh, but we'll get to them. And what he wanted to do was to reconquer them. Constantinople, the city that is the new capital of the Byzantine East, is located right here on the Bosporus. And you can understand why Constantine moved the capital there. It's a naturally fortified location. It's surrounded by water on all three sides. Uh, it has a high um, uh, precipice. So over here on this end of the peninsula, this is really high. So it's a naturally defended location. And it had absolutely superb defenses and walls. In fact, in its entire thousand year history, Constantinople is only conquered twice, only twice. Uh, once in 1204, when the Venetians and the Latins conquered it, and another time in 1453, when the Ottomans conquered it for the last time. That's a pretty impressive history. So you understand why he moved the empire there. It was much more easily defensible. It was much closer to the east where there was trade. And it becomes really a second golden age for Rome. Uh, you have these huge, masterful buildings, etc. So Justinian comes along and we have a kind of reformation of the Roman Empire. He tries to take back most of the West and he succeeds to a large part. He takes back chunks of Spain, North Africa, Italy, but it's never ever going to be the way it was. And within just another couple of centuries, most of the Byzantine Empire in the East is going to be lost, but it's going to be lost to the Muslim invasion. But we'll talk about that another time. As far as the great creations of the Byzantine Empire, uh, the first and foremost is going to be Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia stands as Greek for holy wisdom. And you can ignore the minarets. The minarets here really should, uh, you know, not be there. They are Muslim additions from the Ottoman period. Uh, these were added when it was converted to a mosque in the 15th century. But the original church is this church here. And it was built during the reign of Justinian. It's really a remarkable building. So the whole story of how this thing got built is quite amazing. Uh, people back in the ancient world were sports fans, just like we are. Uh, and the big sport in Constantinople was chariot racing. And there were two teams that were the biggest teams, the Greens and the Blues. Not exactly exciting names. But the Greens and the Blues hated each other, and there was a big riot after... Uh, a victory. That's why this was called the Nike Revolt. Now, uh, these greens and the blues were more than just, you know, soccer hooligans <laughs> or chariot racing hooligans. Um, they were actually kind of functioned almost like quasi-political parties. And a bunch of them revolted against uh, Justinian. In fact, they nearly overthrew his reign. Uh, but then his wife, Theodora, stood up on the tables while Justinian was cowering below, and she ordered Belisarius, the general, to go and, and fight back, and she pretty much saved the empire. Not bad for a woman who started as an erotic dancer with bears. True story. 
Uh, so Theodora is an impressive character. But the end product of this riot is that it destroyed the royal chapel, the royal chapel associated with the palace. And so that gave them the reason to rebuild this building. And Justinian wanted to do something that had never been done before. So he gets a couple of strange guys to do this. Normally you would get a master builder, an architect, stonemasons, but he gets a couple of eggheads. He gets a couple of nerds. Uh, one is a mathematician, the other one is an engineer. And they are Antemius of Trales and Isidore of Miletus. So any of you expecting twins? That's a couple of great name suggestions. Uh, this is Utah. I shouldn't make those kind of suggestions, baby name suggestions. Uh, people in Utah will take me seriously. Uh, and you really had to get a couple of eggheads and nerds because what they were doing was something that had never been done before. And we happen to know all this because the court historian Procopius wrote a massive history on all the buildings. He also wrote a wonderful history called The Secret History, uh, which detailed all the nefarious doings of Justinian and Theodora, which is really fun. It's a great read. Uh, it's full of sin, sex, uh, murder, mayhem, assassinations, it's, and uh, all kinds of depravity. It's, it's the reason you get into history. Anyhow. So when we look at this building, it's a strange building. It has a dome, but unlike the Pantheon, which had a dome over the top of a drum, this one has a dome over the top of a square space. That's a really, really hard thing to do, for one. To transition from a square space to a circular space is really hard. The Pantheon just had to go from a cylinder up to a dome, and they're both circular. Uh, when you try to, you know, square off the circle, uh, that's where problems uh, happen. So they came up with a bunch of ingenious ideas. First and foremost, they built um, a series of massive piers. And these piers are truly colossal, so they can support an enormous amount of weight. You can see them here. But the genius thing about these piers, uh, even though they're massive and they're attached to buttresses on the outside, you can see these enormous buttresses out here that are attached to these piers. In fact, if we go and take a look at a photo of this, you can see those massive piers and the huge buttresses that exist. So really incredible engineering. But the thing that's so great about this is, despite the fact those piers are so massive, you can hardly see them on the inside of the building. The building has been so artfully designed that they blend into the decoration. And so therefore, it looks as if you, you, you look around the room and it's like, what is holding up this massive interior space? And it's not very obvious. Uh, and this was part of the genius of the building. In fact, people described this building, they said it looked like the dome was hung from a chain in, on, in heaven. It didn't look like it could actually be held up. So you have to give credit to Antemios and, and uh, Isidoros to do this. So you can see those massive buttresses and piers on the outside, but what they really do is they make possible an enormous amount of windows. And that's the thing that really sets this building apart. Now, I know that we're used to buildings made out of glass and steel. So we're used to buildings that are just massive amounts of, of just light coming in. But from the perspective of the early Middle Ages, this building was a revelation. There had never been a building that had so many windows, that had so much interior or natural light. Look at all those, those windows up in the dome. They completely separated off. So the buttresses manage you to get this really tall building, but you also need to transition to the dome. And how do you do that? You do that with this triangular vault right here that we call a pendentive. Now, the usual way that you would transition to a dome from a square space is a thing called a squinch. And a squinch is basically you bridge the corner of the square, and that gets you to an octagon. The octagon's pretty close to a cylinder, and then from there you go to the dome. So the pendentive is a little bit more daring. Instead, you have this really amazing swelling triangular vault, and it creates just these voluminous interiors, it's massively gorgeous interiors, lots of glass windows. You can see all the light coming in. It really is impressive. And then when you realize this thing would have been filled with oil lamps, uh, it must have been dazzling. Plus, the entire thing is decorated with marble and with mosaic. Uh, the marble is also so delicately cut. Look at this marble. Uh, the marble has been so deeply undercut that it looks like lace. It doesn't even look like it could hold everything. 
Uh, it doesn't look like it could hold the weight. It looks ephemeral and unsubstantial. And that's actually intentional. This is a thing we call dematerialization. That is, you're a Christian, you believe in the spiritual world. So your buildings, you want them to evoke the spiritual world. But how do you do that? Because the spirit is not something you can touch. It's not something you can hold. Well, thanks to this compilation of ideas called Neoplatonism that existed at the time, there was this belief in light mysticism, that light was the way that you communicated um, the spiritual world. Well, how do you make things look light? You do it by breaking up the surfaces. You break them up into light, delicate surfaces, or you cover the surfaces in gold, endless amounts of gold mosaic. So there's just lots and lots of gold mosaic, uh, all those little tiles. And those tiles are actually set at angles to each other so that when the light of the candles flashes off of them, it doesn't just shine, it sparkles. Uh, I remember I went to St. Andrews on Mount Athos and I was there on the feast day of St. Andrews. They had a massive feast and uh, there was lots of incense in the church. It was really pretty heady and the mass had been taken hours and we were exhausted anyway so it was like 2 a.m in the morning and when and the, and the mass is still going on and then the priests lit all the candles at once it was kind of amazing it was mostly dark up until then then they lit all the candles at once and you could just see it it was like being on the inside of a disco ball the light was everywhere and it was pretty trippy and then they decided to start swinging the chandeliers. I kid you not. This is the funnest thing. They would grab the chandelier and and grab it on a rope and then just start swinging it around like a madman. So you have all these candles and oil lamps on these chandeliers and four or five massive chandeliers and they're moving around. And then if you've ever seen a disco ball, you can imagine the lights sparkling out of everything. It was a trip. It was a total acid trip. And it wasn't much longer after that. I said, I, I gotta go. I gotta go to bed. It was just too much. Again, the idea is to break up the surface to, you know, whenever you see gold in the Christian world, it's to remind you, you're not looking at the real world. You're looking at the spiritual world. All those gold backgrounds and some of these icons that we'll see. When we look at this throne and see Mary on it, you notice the throne is covered in jewels. And they've depicted jewels. I have no idea where we got this idea that heaven looks like, I don't know, a, a, a white suburban gated community in a foggy neighborhood where you're just kind of, uh, it's a boring place in the clouds. Because in Christian, early Christian views, heaven is golden. It is covered with jewels. It's scintillating. It's just overpowering. So whenever we see these images like jewels, like look at, look at her throne. Her throne is covered in pearls. Uh, you can see these pearls and rubies and, and sapphires, and then everything is gold. Now, this is real gold. This is uh, gold leaf on glass uh, blocks. You can see all this gold. It really is just dazzling, uh, and it's quite a, quite a sight to see. Well, I'm going to skip a bit because we've got so much to cover. But I do want to cover uh, a couple more places um, to talk about this same idea. Um. Justinian extended the influence of uh, the empire into Italy for quite some time, and so many of the best monuments of Justinian's reign are actually not in the east, they're in the west, they're in Italy. And there's actually a very important reason for that. Uh, it's because of this little thing we call the iconoclasm, but more on that later. So this is a very early Christian church uh, that was dedicated around the same time as Justinian. Uh, and this is Santa Apollinarian Class A. This is a church that's right next to the city of Ravenna, but this is the port city. This is the city on the coast. And this was an early Christian church dated, dedicated to St. Apollinaris, uh, hence Santa Apollinaria. Uh, and you notice it's a basilica. Notice the bell tower is a completely separate building. Um, it doesn't have a transept because there's not really uh, special relics here. Well, they're relics, but there's nothing like St. Peter's. You don't have to worry about the traffic. So it's still this basilica type. So... When we look back at Hagia Sophia, just briefly, so when we look back at Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia is a, a strange structure because it's more centrally, but it too has a little bit of a basilica to it. So it's kind of like a, it's a morphing of the two forms, a centrally planned uh, martyria or uh, a longitudinal uh, basilica. But this one's very definitely a basilica. And this is a really an amazing church because it's been more or less untouched since the middle of the 6th century. So 1,450 years of, of virtually 
no changes and no restorations. It's amazing. And they've been holding churches and masses in this thing uh, for 1,500 years now. It's really quite remarkable. So notice that we have a basilica. We have columns on either side. Uh, it has a simple wooden roof. The big showstopper is down at the end. Down at the end, we have this beautiful mosaic. And again, it's dealing with this idea of dematerialization. The theme of the mosaic is the transfiguration. Now, the story of the transfiguration is a story that comes out of the Gospels. Um, Christ takes three apostles, Peter, James, and John, and he takes them up to Mount Tabor. And on Mount Tabor, um, they experience a theophany. What is a theophany? A theophany is where God reveals himself as God. For most of the time, Jesus looks like an ordinary man. But every once in a while, he reveals himself as the God he truly is. And he is seen in all of his glory. And Moses and Elijah actually come down to administer to him. And you can actually see we have Moses over here and Elijah over here. And we even have the hand of God. Notice this beautiful gold background, the red and blue clouds. And we have this whole paradisical environment. It's just incredible. So this is the transfiguration. But looking at this transfiguration, you may wonder, uh, wait a minute. We're supposed to be Jesus. And then they're supposed to be Peter, James, and John. I don't see any of them. St. Apollinaris is there. And he's very clearly labeled. But he wasn't at uh, Mount Tabor. What the heck is going on? Well, believe it or not, this is, in fact, the transfiguration. And Peter, James, and John are there. I'm not sure if this sheep is Peter, uh, and these are James and John, but these are Peter, James, and John. <laughs> okay, uh, right off the bat, you should know, Peter, James, and John were not sheep. They were people. So we're dealing in symbolic language. But it gets even stranger when we look at Christ. Where is Christ? Well, Christ is right here. He is right in the dead center, right there. Except instead of being shown as Christ, he's being shown as a jeweled processional cross. And here's a detail comparing it to a processional cross from a little bit later, from the 11th century. But you can see they look very similar. Um, here's a detail. You can see that there is a bust portrait of Christ on the cross, so you know uh, that it's Christ, and it's surrounded by jewels and stars. What the heck does this mean? Um, why on earth are they showing Jesus as a processional cross, and why are they showing the apostles as sheep? Well, let's, let's go through this part by part. One, you'll notice that St. Apollinaris is surrounded by sheep on either side, six on one side, six on the other. So these are the 12 apostles. And this is a way of saying St. Apollinaris is like an apostle. That just as the apostles sent and brought the gospel to the world, St. Apollinaris is the saint that is responsible for bringing the gospel to this part of the world, to Classe and to Ravenna. So that's probably the simplest thing. But the transfiguration is a bit different. Now here is where it shows that by the time we get to the early Christian period, by the time we get to the Byzantine period, they're really not concerned with issues of realism. They're more concerned about symbolism and about telling very important theological concepts through symbolism. Okay, So what's going on here? Um, why are the apostle sheep and why is Jesus a cross? Well, remember what this is. This is a church. Let's go back and show it to you. And this mosaic happens to exist and take place right over let me grab my pen the altar so it is directly over the altar okay so the processional cross was a cross that was used at the beginning of the liturgy the liturgy is the Christian mass the ritual where you celebrate the Lord's Supper. That is what some religions call the Eucharist, some call the communion, Mormons call the sacrament. It is the bread and the wine that represents the flesh and the blood of Christ. Now in Christian traditions, um, 
in Catholic tradition, there's the concept of the transubstantiation. This isn't quite doctrine at this, this point. That hasn't happened yet. But there is this strong association that something mystical, something amazing happens to the bread and to the wine to make it in some way the flesh and blood of Christ. And so you would start off this ritual by bringing the processional cross to the altar. And this was the beginning of the mass. And then the bread and the wine would be blessed, and then they would be distributed to um, the congregants, the worshipers who were there to receive it. So what are they saying? They're trying to make a comparison. They're saying that this wonderful moment where Peter, James, and John uh, who were like sheep to Christ, because he's the good shepherd, saw the transfiguration of Christ and saw him as God, as he truly is. What they're trying to say is that when you come to the altar and you partake at the altar, you are experiencing a similar transfiguration. You are partaking of the flesh and blood of Christ, and the Spirit of God is coming and dwelling in you, and you are being transfigured. And when you see these altar, these artifacts on the altar, they are transfigured. They are changed somehow, mystically, into the blood and the body of Christ. That's a pretty heady argument, but it's a pretty strong comparison, and it's, a, it's what is happening here. It shows that in rapid order, Christians had really changed the nature of imagery, that it was not about portraying reality. They couldn't care less. <laughs> they couldn't care less about reality. What they were about was trying to get you to understand deeper theological, deeper mystical truths. This is really edgy. Uh, in fact, it was controversial even in the time. To take somebody like Christ and show him as a cross, even though a cross is a symbol of Christ, was a little bit weird. And especially it was weird to show um, Peter, James, and John as sheep, to use this heavy symbolic language. And this will actually cause troubles going forward. This kind of complex imagery will have problems going forward. Let's take a look at another church that's also in uh, nearby. This is Ravenna. Classe and Ravenna are right next to each other. And this is San Vitale. And San Vitale is dedicated to San Vitalis. San Vitalis is another one of these early Christian saints that brought Christianity to the region. Right off the bat, you should be able to tell this is a centrally planned structure. So instead of a basilica, we have a central plan. The relics of San Vitalis are here. So because his relics are here, this is like a mausoleum. This is like a martyrium. This is a circular structure. So there is a kind of sense and reason into why they use basilica some places and why they use circular structures other places. Um, but, you know, we're going to see that more exclusively, they're going to use round structures in the east and basilicas in the west, but we're not quite there yet. So we have this beautiful circular structure, and in the apse, we have some of the most gorgeous mosaics uh, ever preserved. Looking down into the apse, here we have this wonderful view of Christ in majesty. Here we again have the golden background, the golden background indicating that we have this transcendent realm, red and gold clouds. Notice that we have a rainbow. See the rainbow? Uh, the rainbow goes over the top of Christ here. This is really kind of cool. Uh, rainbows represent judgment. I know that's kind of strange because we think they mean tolerance. <laughs> but in the Bible, the rainbow was given as a sign to Noah that God would not destroy the world again by fire. And you see rainbows come up in the book of Revelation all the time uh, as emblems of God's judgment. So this is a last judgment scene. And there's lots of things that indicate this last judgment scene. For one, Christ is sitting on an orb representing the universe. Living waters are flowing from him. all these beautiful flowers. And this is, this is the end times. He is holding a scroll with seven seals. This is the scroll with seven seals. So any of you Metallica fans out there, there it is. Okay. Uh, and what we see is Christ presenting a crown. Uh, the book of Revelation says that martyrs will receive a crown, and this is St. Vitalis over here. St. Vitalis, he has his hands covered in a gesture of humility. He is there to receive the crown. Over here, we have another guy called Ecclesius, and he's actually handing a church. And this is a way of saying that Ecclesius was the guy who originally built this church. And so what we have is a scene of the end times, a scene of Christ in glory. 
There's one detail here that's a bit perplexing to most people. We've talked about it before in the last one in early Christian art. It's kind of amazing to still see it here at this date. And that's the depiction of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, notice he's clean shaven. He does not have a forked beard. Notice he doesn't have like shoulder length hair. He has short hair, a kind of a bowl cut. Uh, again, what's going on? Um, the thing you have to remember about all of this is uh, people did not think about images of Christ in the way that we did. Christ in the early Christian and in the early medieval period is a chameleon. He changes forms as needed to fit the context at the times. And sometimes he will see him bearded, and sometimes you will see him not. And it really matters on the context. Okay, so why isn't he bearded in this case? Well, he isn't bearded in this case because he is being depicted as, oops, as if he is emperor of the universe. So again, put yourself in the perspective of uh, the artist who's creating this. You're trying to create this image of majesty, of somebody ruling in power and majesty. How do you do it? Well, who is the most majestic, powerful ruler that you know? It's going to be the Byzantine emperor. And here he is depicted as a Byzantine emperor. He's wearing a purple toga. Purple was reserved for Byzantine emperors. He has the gold clavi or the gold stripes. That means he's a Byzantine emperor. And at this time, Byzantine emperors had clean-shaven faces, short hair. So he's going to have a clean-shaven face, short hair. And you see this in lots of different depictions of Christ. Uh, sometimes Christ is depicted wearing armor because he is the person who conquers evil. And in that case, his hairstyles are gone. He's going to have a very short beard and kind of crew cut hair because that's the way military men wore their hair. And sometimes you're going to see him with a, a short beard and longer hair. Why do we see him with a short beard and longer hair? Because that was the hairstyle of philosophers, of teachers, of people who were wise men. And he was a wise man. Now, sometime around the 7th to the 8th century, Christians kind of get tired of this changing, shifting image of Jesus and basically solidify the image of Jesus into the image that we see now with the longer shoulder length hair and the shorter forked beard. But that hasn't happened yet. In large part, it hasn't happened because we haven't gone through this very difficult time period we call the iconoclasm. You're going to see that there's lots of different images that eventually end up troubling. And they lined up into a conflict that we call the iconoclasm, which is a war, a literal war, over images. But in addition to Christ, we also have a couple other characters here we ought to take a look. So here in the wall below Christ is another large panel. And in this panel, we have Justinian himself. Justinian is standing there. He is carrying a bowl as a gift to the church. He is preceded by the bishop who is carrying a processional cross. So he's got a jeweled cross. And another one is carrying a censer. Another one of the priests is carrying a, a gospel book. Uh, behind him is his general, Belisarius, who has a kind of a short beard. Uh, and then behind them are his uh, bodyguard, this kind of entourage of very colorful barbarians. Notice the gold background. Notice the gems, the pearls. Again, this is not supposed to be a literal scene. This is a spiritual scene. Uh, when you look at Justinian, do you notice that he has a halo? That seems very bizarre. We don't think of rulers as having halos. We think of saints and divine figures as having halos. But in the original iconography, it is kings that have halos. Halos indicate royalty, not holiness. And this idea that halos are only reserved for holiness hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen for another couple centuries. In another couple centuries, we won't see halos on nobles. We'll only see halos on people who are uh, holy. Uh, but look at this elaborate crown he has. You can see the mosaic. You can see the, the tiles that exist. Notice also how they're standing. Notice that they're, this is a procession. They're supposed to be walking towards Christ. But notice that they're all face front. And they look like paper cutouts. They're all, notice they're walking on each other's feet. Oh my gosh, it's kind of funny. You can see how 
Um, they are treading on top of people's feet. They're stepping on each other's feet here. They're just overlapping. There's no depth to this at all. Again, it's, it's bizarre to see them walking like paper cutouts or walking like crabs. But this is the nature of the art. And this isn't because they couldn't do it realistic. Byzantine art moves deliberately towards a representation that is flatter, that is more graphic because you're not supposed to be showing the real world. You're showing the spiritual world. This isn't a literal representation of Justinian. This is a spiritual representation of Justinian. The gold background indicates that you're looking into the spiritual realm. Uh, Orthodox often describe um, icons as windows onto heaven. You're supposed to imagine that you're looking onto the metaphysical or the mystical state of Justinian himself. Uh, there's a similar panel on the opposite wall, but this one shows Theodora. So Theodora started as a courtesan. She was an erotic dancer who danced with bears, but Justinian fell in love with her and made her the empress, which was a huge scandal. But it turned out she was probably a better ruler than he was anyway, so it turned out okay. She's just absolutely decked out to the nines, covered in jewels and pearls. And look at this fabulous entourage. You know, we think of of, of Greek and Roman art as, as being bland and white, but this gives you a sense of textiles. Look at the beautiful textiles. Uh, Byzantines actually had horizontal uh, looms with upright heddles, so they had this ability to make these complex weaves. So those beautiful textiles you see back there with those women wearing, those are accurate. Uh, you can even see that, um, you can even see that Theodora herself, on her garment right here, we see three figures, and these figures are, in fact, the three magi, and they're presenting gifts. And, of course, that's what she's doing. She's presenting a gift. She is presenting a gift to Christ. In this case, she's delivering a chalice. So uh, Justinian is giving a plate to hold the bread. She's giving a chalice to hold the wine. These are the artifacts. And what we're supposed to get out of this is that all of these characters together are together in the presence of God, that in the same way that um, St. Vitalis is receiving a crown and is in the presence of Christ. Justinian and Theodora want to show that they too are giving gifts to Christ, that they too are in the presence of Christ. I mean, they, uh, Byzantines know this isn't literal. This is an attempt to show the spiritual reality, a way of the king and the queen, um, the emperor and the empress, to show that they are in harmony with God and his mission. So what we've seen up to this point is a lot of really interesting things. A lot of really interesting things of how radical a departure Byzantine art is from Roman art, how Christ is ever-changing. He's a chameleon. Sometimes we see him as an emperor. Sometimes we see him as an actual object or processional cross. Sometimes we see saints as sheep uh, and apostles as sheep. And sometimes we see uh, former courtesans who have become empresses uh, with images of the three magi, the three wise men, giving gifts on their clothing. So it shows a very dynamic world. It shows where a world where images are used constantly not to give literal meanings, but to give spiritual meanings. She has the three magi on her dress because she is giving a gift to Christ in the same way the three magi are. Uh, Jesus looks like an emperor because he is acting as an emperor in that moment. And this actually leads to a lot of trouble. And this is our last topic. This is the topic we'll close on out in this lecture. And that is the concept of icons. By this point in the Byzantine world, we had developed a tradition of icons. Now, icon just literally means in the Greek, ikonos just means image. That's all it means. But what we mean by it is a panel painting used for devotional purpose. It is a panel used to focus your religious intentions. And icons are still used to this day in the Orthodox Church. But this became a crisis around the year 720. There was a conflict over images called the iconoclasm. And in 720, there was a dispute over the nature of images, where someone saw an image of John the Baptist, and he was pointing to an image of the Lamb. And they were saying, well, wait a minute, that shows Christ as the Lamb. Well, Christ is the Lamb, but he's the Lamb symbolically. And they said, no, wait a minute, Christ is a real person. This is getting to be a little bit too much like idolatry. 
So if you remember your Sunday school, second commandment for the Jews and for Christians is you shall have no graven images. And yet by the sixth century, we clearly see we have Christians using images everywhere as part of their worship and as part of their full focus. So in 720, a real split happens and you have emperors and religious figures coming out against the use of images. Now it's important to note this only happened in the East. It only happened in the Byzantine East. It doesn't happen in the West for a variety of reasons. One, uh, the Pope just more or less put the kibash on it and said, nope, we're not going to fight over images. Images are fine. The other thing was is that the West isn't a unified um, country anymore. No one could have enforced a ban on images if they tried. Uh, there were it had been broken up into several different kingdoms, but the East is still unified. And so they could, they could absolutely force these purges. And so you have a, a, a war developed and it really is a war. They actually do fight and kill each other. Monks are dragged down into the street. Icons are burned and destroyed. And we have a huge destruction of images. In fact, that's part of the reason we've been looking at stuff in Italy, because a lot of the stuff before the eighth and ninth century in the East doesn't exist because it got destroyed uh, because the people said these are idols and we're getting rid of them and they whitewashed churches and they destroyed them and they got rid of them but eventually slowly over time the iconodules or sometimes the iconophiles as they're called the lovers of images win out they make a case that no we're not worshiping these images the images are just helping us focus our attention um, we're worshiping not the image we're worshiping through the image to the mystical understanding that lies beyond that the icon is a window onto heaven and we are looking past it into the real mystical world uh there's a couple of writers that are really important in this um saint john of damascus um saint theodore the studite and the guy that i happen to wrote my dissertation about uh, cosmos and Nicoplastes, but we'll never we won't go into that depth there were a lot of writings that basically argued that no god deals with images images are fine christ himself is kind of an image of the living god and he says if you've seen me you've seen the father so you can have this so a lot of these icons were destroyed but we do have a few from this time period most of them are actually um from this place called St. Catherine's Monastery. St. Catherine's Monastery is a monastery way down here uh, in the far deep uh, recesses of Sinai. Now, what's interesting is at the time of the iconoclasm, this was actually under Muslim control. Uh, and so it's a Greek Orthodox monastery. It's a Christian monastery, but it was under Muslim control. This monastery is, is located right on Mount Sinai, and this is supposed to commemorate the location where Moses saw the burning bush. But as it turned out, it was a major center of artistic production. They made a lot of icons there. It's also a major center of uh, pilgrimage trade. This is uh, kind of what it looks like today. Uh, it's barren. I've made the joke before, but the miracle of the burning bush is not that Moses saw a burning bush. It's that he saw a bush at all. St. Catherine's is really dry. Uh, it's destitute. Seriously, it makes Utah look like uh, the rainforest by comparison. But that actually happens to be great because it's a beautiful climate for preserving icons. And some of the earliest icons we have come from this time period. And they come from the collection of St. Catherine's. Now, the other reason these icons survive is because St. Catherine's was outside of the control of the Byzantine emperor. So when a Byzantine emperor or a patriarch said, that's it, images are done, uh, they couldn't send soldiers or, or monks down there to ban these images or haul them off or burn them because it was under Muslim control and Muslim territory. So the monks at St. Catherine's would just very pragmatically say, okay, images are banned this year. <laughs> we'll take the images down. We'll go put them in the basement and we'll ignore them. <laughs> and then five years later, a new emperor comes to power and says, no, images are now allowed. And they would just say, okay, fine. And they would get them out, <laughs> which was very practical. So some of the only images from before the eighth and ninth century uh, are down here. And they're really remarkable. This is an example of, of one of the best. This is the icon of Christ Pantocrator. Uh, this is painted in encaustic. Encaustic is beeswax uh, and it's mixed with pigments. And so you have to melt it to make it work. But right away, you can see that it has this very expressive quality. The eyes are overly large. Christ is making this gesture with his two hands, fingers, and his thumb extended, which 
probably represents the Trinity, but it also is probably a borrowing from earlier Roman kind of gestures of oration or salute. He holds a jeweled gospel book. He has this golden halo. When you look into his eyes, one eye looks upward and one eye looks straight at you, which is kind of unnerving. They're not trying to suggest that Christ had a lazy eye. What they're saying is, again, symbolic. Again, the emphasis is not, the, the, you're not trying to paint the real Jesus. What you're trying to do is paint the symbolic Jesus. One of the arguments about Jesus at this time is the nature of Christ. Is God half, is Jesus half man and half God? Or is he fully God that just took on the form of a man? Or is he a man that somehow was invested with the Spirit of God? There were all of these debates on the nature of Christ. Eventually, they decided that he has two natures, that he is both simultaneously fully divine and simultaneously fully mortal at the same time. And so one eye gazes up towards heaven to indicate his divine nature, and one eye gazes towards us to indicate his mortal nature. But even still, I think you can look at the character of this and, and recognize why Christians were troubled by this, why it began to feel like idolatry. Um, when we compare this to earlier Greco-Roman painting of just a few centuries earlier, you can see the technique, the expression is very similar. This is a Fayum portrait that was painted in the 2nd, 3rd century, uh, comes out of Fayum, Egypt. This is painted in Sinai, Egypt, and it's the same technique. They're both encaustic. And in fact, we do know about icons in the pagan world. Um, people did have icons in the pagan world. This is a panel painting that was used as a form of idolatry and worship. And to be perfectly honest, there doesn't seem to be any break in continuity between the icons of the pagan past and the icons of the Christian late antique period. Uh, and so that's problematic. <laughs> um, it seems like we have a practice that's just adopted into the Christian world. And so you can understand why they fought this 120 year conflict that most of the time was bannings and purges, but did flare up into actual battles and wars and, and death and mayhem. You can understand why they fought this conflict, uh, because there is such a strong similarity between these. But I think by the 8th century, Christians had found a way to um, explain these and internalize these uh, to the satisfaction of all Christians. And in fact, after 843, um, icons become accepted in the East. Uh, they were never rejected in the West, by the way. But the West doesn't like icons as much as the East. Oh, the West prefers statues and other paintings and other things. But icons as religious panel paintings are a major feature of the Orthodox religion today. Most Orthodox homes will have an icon corner where they have several icons of their favorite saints or their protective saints um, and of the Virgin Mary and of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's a major feature. And in fact, the Feast of Orthodoxy, which celebrates Orthodoxy, happens on the anniversary of the rest restoration of images in 843. It's really kind of uh, unique and amazing. Uh, and so I think it's wrong to describe Christians today as idolaters. There's some radical Christians who think this is a form of idolatry. And in fact, this, this question doesn't go away because when we get to the 16th century, the Protestants come in and they think what the Catholics are doing idolatry. I've even heard a few uh, people declare Catholics to be idolatrous, and I don't think that's accurate. I think rather these are aids. These are things that are helpful in your devotion. Uh, and hopefully that will help you to be more respectful of people in the future. But it's a very old tradition. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm going a little long and I don't really want to belabor. Um, we're only going to touch briefly on some Byzantine stuff from now on. We're going to move to the West and focus more on the West. And that's really tragic because you just have to remember that oh, there's another 800 years of Byzantine history and Byzantine art some of the most beautiful art, the most sublime art that's ever been created. But that's more of a focus for a medieval class. And uh, because this class focuses on the Western tradition and how we wind up to the Renaissance, we're really not going to talk very much more about the Byzantine world from here on out. We're going to go back to the West. So in our next lecture, what we'll describe is what was going on in the West. So while the Byzantine Empire was reinventing itself, this Eastern Roman Empire was reinventing itself into this brand new Christian entity, uh, the Western Empire in the West collapsed entirely, and you have a whole new collection of people move in. And these people are the barbarians. And quite frankly, they're our ancestors. You know, well, you know, I can't see you, but I've seen the class before. 
And just by judging in the past, uh, by the relative pallor of everyone in the class, the blonde hair, the red hair, the freckles, the pale eyes, these are going to be the ancestors of most of the people in the class. A few of you exempted who actually have melanin and don't have higher risk of skin cancer. But the rest of us, us pale people, uh, these are our ancestors. These are the barbarians who came in. And even though they came in hostile to the Greeks and the Romans, they eventually become the inheritors of the classical tradition and they carry it through into the Middle Ages. So next time we'll talk about the fall of Rome and the rise of barbarian art and the early Middle Ages. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.